cerebellum is a, a machine for feed forward modulation. In order for the cerebellum to work, it absolutely requires errors. If you did everything perfectly from the get go, cerebellum would have absolutely no information to work with. It needs errors. It only works um, by learning from mistakes. That's what the cerebellum does, is it makes mistakes and it learns from them. If the mistakes never get make, made, it cannot learn. So I, I think that's a lesson for life, personally. Um, I think a, as with the cerebellum, so with us all. Uh, so the feed forward modulation is in order to try to avert, avert those errors in the future. And you can think about this as you learn to make a movement, or as you learn, let's say you are walking, you're walking on ground and then you go to sea. You have to learn how to get your sea legs. That is, it, it's, it's almost as though it starts to feel right and then the movement becomes right. Let's take another example. If, if I am trying to learn a new, uh, a, a new movement, such as a tennis serve, I, I do things and I take that movement apart, but eventually I put it together. If I, if I do it incorrectly, I usually know the moment I make that error, I know. And how do I know? Because I am getting back the wrong sensory information. If I was going right, my cerebellum would be getting back all the correct sensory information. It would feel right, it would feel right, it would feel right. The moment that the, the parallel fiber information that is coming back into the cerebellum deviates from what is expected by many repetitions, uh, then it feels wrong. And that's the moment where the movement went off. This is why uh, people who play sports, who play instruments, they like to go on automatic pilot. They don't like to, to uh, cognitively direct every movement. They want their cerebellum to do it. They want their cerebellum to be on autopilot, that is our autopilot. Our autopilot is to allow the cerebellum to do its job with minimal bossiness coming from the cerebral cortex. You gotta l let the cerebral cortex chill out, let the cerebellum do its job, and it will do, uh, it'll engage the right movements um, according to what the sensory feedback I is at the moment. So for example, as I try to, to touch the finger, I, I have to excite an agonist, but also start to break as I approach this finger. There is an internal model in my cerebellum for what I need to, to reach that finger. I'm not, I'm not gonna, my internal model should be correct. It should uh, lead me to touch the finger. If my internal model is too exuberant, uh, I, start to, I start to get information that I'm too close and I slow down, all right? And then I'm gonna, mit, I'm gonna undershoot. It, on the other hand, if I start out too slowly, now I'm getting the wrong information, I'm gonna push, uh, I'm going to speed up and overshoot. And this mismatch between my internal model and, um, and, and the actual uh, circumstances is something that can be played with uh, in, in, for, thera for therapeutic purposes. And this is the work of Amy Bastian, who has done some really exciting work trying to either add a load or, or reduce the load um, to make uh, cerebellar patients' internal model uh, more accurately reflect the, the outer circumstances. Now, what do we do when we are babies? We do uh, millions and, and, and through our lives, billions and, and even trillions of repetitions of certain movements. What are the ones that we do a lot of? Well, we do a lot of standing. And standing, as you know, has postural sway. So how many postural sways do we have, have, we, have we engaged in in our lives? 
by the time we get to, say, 70 years old? Well, it's in the order of trillions because it's, it's several times per second. Um, uh, and, and what about steps? Well, we're, we take billions of steps. And so we're really, really, really expert at this. We have this down, and the, the chances of making an error are very low. But if the circumstances change, if we now we're, we're used to walking on land, we go to sea, we now change that. We have to learn a new way of moving, a new way of walking. We do learn that say, a week in, a month in, depending on, um, uh, depending on our abilities. Uh, and, and then, and then you're, you're good for a while, and then you come back to land. And can you learn the land one again? Well, of course you can, because you've had so, many, so much practice that you easily revert to that. The next time you go to sea, it'll take you a shorter time to get your sea legs. So another example is simply, if. If I juggle and I successfully juggle, say, for an hour, I, I struggle and I struggle, I can't juggle, and finally I get it going and I struggle, I, I juggle for an hour, well, tomorrow I'll get going faster. But if I don't juggle for two years and I pick it up again, I'm probably going to have, oh, it's going to take me a while. But on the other hand, if I juggled every day for a year, I can wait 10 years and, and pick it up again. So this is the, the, uh, the link between motor learning and, and the motor coordination. You can pick up things that you have practiced before. Those circuits are, are sitting there waiting for you um, more easily uh, re-engaged. Another feature that you see with cerebellar learning uh, is the, one of the easiest ways to explain this is um, to imagine walking on a treadmill. So you're walking on a treadmill and, or running on a treadmill and you, you go for a half an hour, 45 minutes. And then when you get off, the walk that you have now on the concrete without the, uh, without the treadmill, without the resistance of the treadmill, now you feel as though you're flying. You feel as though it's really easy. You're on the moon or something. There's the, you're, it, the steps are really easy. And that is an example of what one would call the negative image of the modulation. So to walk on the treadmill, you had to engage a certain amount of force. And now you're, you're on the uh, ground, and you have to engage less force. You are, you're, see, you're feeling the, the negative of the modulation. The modulation, you just disengage. It doesn't disengage right away. It takes a few steps. So within a few steps, you no longer feel as though you're flying. You just saw what your cerebellum had done for you. All right, so how do you, how do you test this in, in, a, in a patient? Well, one way is um, just go back and forth, see whether they can point to a, 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 your finger. And that's one type of test. Uh, another really common test is to see whether they can do, uh, see whether a person can do this kind of a movement. So this is a rapid back and forth. Um, this is called, can you see that? Okay, so this is called diodokokinesia. Um, and if a normal, uh, a healthy person can do this in some way, the person with a cerebellar lesion has dysdiodokokinesia and in which case it's slower and it's, it's, it's less smooth, okay? And they, in, in general, this becomes much more belabored. Okay, so, so what I want you to take home from this uh, video is that what the cerebellum is doing is always trying to anticipate what sensory information it it should be getting. And when that sensory information that it doesn't, that it, it expects to get is not what it does get, it issues an error message. And that error message is what enables the cerebellum to do its job. So it prevents in the future that same error from being made. All right, in the next video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the specific, we're gonna start to look at the specific circuits that come out of the cerebellum. <music>